Welcome to Apple Arcade Plus, the show where you get to hear from the people behind Apple Arcade games. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. Once we sort of started the idea of like what we were working on and like the art style came very quickly after that, uh, Joe, the lead artist, I basically said to him like, look, I've got two things. I want it to be something that's really bright and eye-catching and I don't want it to be pixel art because like a lot of games in this kind of genre use pixel art and I thought that we could do something to sort of stand out and differentiate ourselves a little bit. So he very quickly came up with like this this stuff and it was like oh yeah this like I mean this is really kind of like 90s cartoon stuff. Welcome to another episode of Apple Arcade Plus. In this episode you'll be hearing from Tony, a game developer from the Ant Workshop, the makers of Dead End Job. This is a game, as you'll hear, is just loaded with personality and style and really resonated with me. From a gameplay perspective, it learns from some of my favorite titles out there, including Luigi's Mansion and the original Legend of Zelda. Tony's passion for this game really shines through in this interview, and he shares some fascinating tidbits about the game. If you enjoyed this episode, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Every review goes a really long way in helping others discover this show. You can send your feedback to me at applearcadepodcast at gmail.com. You can find the website at applearcadepodcast.com, and you can follow the show on Twitter at Apple Arcade Plus. With that, here's my interview with Tony, all about Dead End Job. Enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Tony. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Can you first introduce yourself in your game Dead End Job? Sure, yeah. So uh, my name's Tony Gowland. I'm an indie developer. I set up a company called Ant Workshop a few years ago, and we've recently been making Dead End Job, which is uh, just released on Apple Arcade. And Dead End Job is it's kind of a combination of like a sort of cartoony game where you run around, you buildings, you shoot ghosts, you catch ghosts, and all of that earns you money from clients. It is legally very different from Ghostbusters. Yeah, and there are aspects of the game that remind me of Luigi's Mansion, and then there are the Ghostbuster aspects, and like parts of the map remind me a bit of you know the original Zelda with the dungeon map and how it uh, kind of laid rooms out there. Can you kind of speak about where the inspirations for the game came from? Because I'm finding some really nice ones. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, I mean, yeah, so like Luigi's Mansion was like was a big influence. So when we sort of started out on Dead End Job, we were kind of j- j- almost like as a, as a challenge to ourselves, really. We set out with the idea of like, okay, how can we make a shooter, but that's that's kind of not really, like you're not just kind of running around shooting people quite so much. One of the things we were thinking about was you could play like a fireman running around like putting out fires. But one of the other things was obviously like Luigi's Mansion and this kind of whole idea of running around sucking up ghosts, like vacuum cleaning ghosts. So that was like, that was, I mean, I'm a massive Ghostbusters fan. So it's like, that was really appealing um, and was a lot more like the kind of line that we went down. There was also, yeah, so also like, um, like you mentioned, like the Zelda map and obviously there's things like Zelda and Binding of Isaac nuclear throne and the gungeon like all of those games were influences in terms of like the kind of structure and like the the kind of dungeon crawling and the way that like the sort of i don't really like to say it but like the kind of almost roguelite elements where it's it's got that kind of procedural generation and um so the game's a bit different every time you play and and kind of how you keep making that interesting and how you kind of weave progression for the player into all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, the progression's rather interesting because if you die, if you uh, get attacked so much where you have to bail out of the a mission, you don't start over. Instead, you cash out of all the rewards you earned up till that point, and your life as a character moves on, and I believe there's a 30-day cycle to this game. What's kind of the ramifications if you don't make it through levels very often and get to day 30 and can you not pay your rent or what what kind of <laughs> what happens to your character so one of the things so like i said like things like enter the gungeon and band of isaac and stuff like that a big influence on us uh, one of the things that i do find quite frustrating with those types of games is that um because like that sort of dungeon crawler you can play through a level um, and that maybe takes you 10 minutes and then you get to a boss and then you fight that boss and it's like okay i've beaten that and then you play through the next level and it's harder and that maybe takes another 15 and you, you do this and eventually you'll die and it's maybe you've spent an hour or something playing that and then there's no kind of 
or there's very little kind of like progression there and sometimes it can feel a little bit like oh, I've, I've sort of just wasted my hour of playing I mean like I've enjoyed it but it's like I feel like I'm not kind of moving forward at all and that was sort of one of the things that we we wanted to do to make it a bit more friendly and a bit more so it felt a bit more respectful of like a kind of player's time and so we came up with this whole uh story about your mentor she's uh, she's recently died and you've got until the end of them like the end of the month to rescue her soul otherwise she'll be trapped as a ghost uh in the, like the ghost dimension forever which is like literally the worst thing that can happen to a ghost hunter so yeah we've got like this kind of 30 day period where it's like you're trying to earn enough money money so that one of your colleagues can build this piece of equipment i mean none of it makes any sense at all really <laughs> <laughs> it's ve- it's very kind of saturday morning cartoon logic but yeah so you're trying to earn enough money so that your, your colleague can make this piece of equipment and then you can go and rescue your mentor soul but without kind of wanting to give too much weight like the game is very flexible if you don't make that um yeah like that that whole kind of loop when you like when you get to the end of the month and whether you've completed the month or whether you haven't completed the month the game kind of takes all of that in its stride and yeah there's kind of once you get past that point you will see that it's like the game kind of kind of adapts and it's everything is kind of in universe and sort of as makes as much sense as it as it kind of can within its own sort of world but yeah because we really wanted that sort of thing of like okay well if you die if you've spent 10 minutes playing that level you still want that like the money for for what you've done there to kind of come back and and act as a reward and it means that if you're kind of quite close to your goal like you can kind of like do these jobs just to sort of push yourself over the edge rather than like rather than having to always commit to okay I'm going to do I'm going to spend 20 minutes 30 minutes playing this game now like you can do just like a little job that's like maybe it's just like a little kind of like five minute job or something and still feel like you're kind of making progress there. Gotcha. And you mentioned earlier there are aspects of the game that are procedurally generated. There's different maps that you are able to gain access to like business district and industrial estate uh what aspects are procedurally generated uh yeah so the procedural generation we use it just just to kind of keep uh keep levels kind of feeling a bit interesting so like a lot of the environments you go into a lot it's all every room is kind of like this rectangular room the layout like the actual layout of where the rooms are within a level is procedure generated and also like a lot of the layouts of furniture within those rooms we've got some rooms where they're like completely generated and some rooms where we've kind of we've influenced it a bit to make it so it's like it's nice layouts that either like look really good or like things that we particularly wanted to do for certain bits of gameplay also like the kind of where enemies appear and what types of enemies appear and kind of in what order like so we've got like kind of spawn patterns and things set up and exactly kind of like how those all fit together that's all procedure generated like every time you play like a mission even if you're kind of keeping on going through like the office or whatever it's always going to feel like a little bit different and you're never going to be entirely sure of like okay if i go into this room this is like i'm definitely going to see this and there's like there's a lot of different kind of pickups and abilities and stuff in the game as well and like which ones of those you get to see at any given time uh, like that stuff all kind of comes into the procedural generation as well okay and there are different areas. Do the different areas, say, if you're in the restaurant area, are there more like chef ghosts and food-related ghosts? Or how, how does Restaurant Avenue and the different areas affect your enemy? So pretty much all, like, the, all of the enemies are themed to the areas that you go to. The restaurant one has got one of my favorite enemies, which is it's like a kind of dead chicken ghost that walks around. Uh, its neck's been snapped, so it's kind of it's walking. Uh, with its backside up in the air and it fires uh, explosive eggs at you that like work like little hand grenades it's one of the first enemies that we came up with it's got a lovely poultry geist as well lovely name to it lovely uh, punning name there um so yeah it was like it was one of the first ones that we came up with and it's definitely one of my favorites um but yeah so like each area that you go to there's kind of different ghosts and some of the ghosts that you've 
people already seen behaving like a uh, sort of look different to fit the environment and have like slightly different behaviors as well so there's always like always new things to kind of keep you on your toes and did you know going into this game that it would be made for apple arcade not originally so we we did sort of uh start out developing it just uh in general i work on a mac so like we kind of we'd always known that it was like okay a mac version is definitely one of the things that we're going to do and it's definitely going to come out but yeah like earlier in the year when we found out about apple arcade it just seemed like such a fantastic opportunity to be a part of form launch on that kind of scale and with like a a partner like apple is just something like like we're a really small indie company you just don't really get the opportunity to be a part of that that often so yeah it was just like it was a an amazing thing to to be able to kind of get involved with. Yeah. And did the approach to the game itself change when you knew about how Apple Arcade worked? In terms of like the controls and things, obviously when we were developing it originally, like a lot of it was kind of mouse and keyboard or controller based. Um, Yeah. So when we were, once we were sort of looking at Arcade, the requirement to like put in touchscreen controls for the mobile versions. So we like played quite a lot of different games that have like that kind of twin stick on screen controls and we're sort of playing around with those just to get a feel for sort of how other people are approaching that. So there was definitely that kind of thing. But in terms of what the game is and how it's like how it's all structured and what content's in there, like Apple like they really kind of they were just happy with it how it was and like they, it wasn't like one of these kind of things of like okay we want your game on the service but now you have to change loads and loads of stuff it was it was very much like okay we think your game is cool uh, and we'd like it on our service so please just kind of keep making the game that you want to make and i think arcade is very good in that sort of sense that there's quite a broad range of there's some games where they feel very small like sort of succinct things that were made specifically for arcade whereas there's some things that feel a bit more like they're kind of almost like more traditional home console experiences but the fact that you can then play them on your apple tv or play them on your phone or on your ipad i think is like it's just a really cool broad range of games that they've got on there yeah and something i'm curious about you mentioned the mac version uh which will be launching with catalina i believe does mouse and keyboard is that an input that's allowed in apple arcade for max yes yeah i hope so okay, um, great. Yeah. yeah i was not um, sure on that yeah yes certainly a dead end job on on the mac you can yeah you can play with mouse and keyboard or uh or with a controller Excellent. And then something I just loved opening the game was kind of the Ren and Stimpy show kind of feel of like you're watching a little cartoon that like sets you in the environment and mood of it. Where did that idea come from? And is that something you guys worked on internally or did you partner with someone to bring that to life? Once we sort of started the idea of like what we were working on and like the art style came very quickly after that. Uh, Joe, the lead artist, I basically said to him like, look, I've got two things. I want it to be something that's really bright and eye-catching and I don't want it to be pixel art because like a lot of games in this kind of genre use pixel art and I thought that we could do something to sort of stand out and differentiate ourselves a little bit. So he very quickly came up with like this, like his art style is quite similar to that anyway like his sort of normal art style and he came up with like this this stuff and it was like oh yeah this like i mean this is really kind of like 90s cartoon stuff and one of the things that i've always like i love about cartoons like the things that like i really enjoyed when i was growing up like uh, animaniacs and freakazoid and stuff like that is they had these amazing like 30 second intro sequence that basically like they introduce you to all of the characters and who all of the people are and kind of what the setup of the show is so it doesn't matter whether you've watched whether you're watching the very first episode or watching like an episode somewhere in like the third series of this cartoon like you would still drop in and you understand okay that's who that person is that's who that person is this is how they all fit together this is what's sort of going on and i just thought like it was such a cool opening for a game like so many games you you start playing them and they've got quite slow openings where it's trying to introduce all the characters and trying to introduce all the backstory and stuff and i just thought like if we have one of these these sort of intro sequences and that where it like breaks the fourth wall a bit and kind of just talks to you as a player and says okay this is what's going on now you don't really need to worry about all of that sort of stuff because the game's quite daft and 
don't take it too seriously. Again, it's like this really eye-catching kind of opener to the game. Yeah, and throughout the game, there are just little mini cartoons you get to experience as you go through the story, which I, I love that as well. Those cutscenes, we kind of got a writer in to help us with like a, with a lot of that sort of stuff. And yeah, again, like he, he just knocked out of the park. Again, we sort of wanted to keep it quite short and quite snappy. But one of the other things that I really liked about like again like back to the cartoons that i i always think of they'll quite often have like these kind of cutaways where it's either a different art style or it's photographs or something like that like even when you think to something like spongebob squarepants like the very first thing that you see on an episode of spongebob is the painting of like the captain uh, with like his lips moving with like that's filmed and sort of imposed over the top yeah like it's not cartoon at all so it was that kind of thing of like okay at what like what points during the game can we kind of almost like cut away to having like uh, like these close-ups or like different art styles and things and yeah so there's there's um a bunch of that kind of as you go through like one of the cutscenes. i think it's it happens pretty much like i think after your first level like there's an in-game like kind of handbook thing where it like it lists like all of your player statistics it lists all the enemies that you found all the items that you found all of that kind of stuff and the the kind of cutscene where the two main characters are talking about that book still makes me laugh like it makes me laugh now and i've seen it hundreds of times (laughs) yeah now something i'm curious about was localization a challenge with this style and implementing that across different regions it wasn't too bad one of the things with arcade as well is like obviously all of the games have to be localized into like quite a lot of language it's again it's really cool what apple have done in terms of saying like okay all of the games need to be localized into i think there's like 15 or 16 different languages and there's some like uh arabic that actually not a lot of games seem to get localized into some of them were quite a challenge so there's obviously there are things like arabic or um like japanese and like chinese and and character sets that unusual to me as a western developer basically there are certain things where i could sit there and kind of go okay i i think that the localization on this is right there are some that like basically we got like the we got like the kind of localized text back from the localization agency it was very much a case of like okay i'm going to put this in the game and then like we're going to have to find someone that can look at this and tell me whether we've whether we've done it right or not and yeah so we like we kind of got localization qa to to look at things and kind of say like okay in terms of like this language or this language these bits are hard to read like i didn't realize that there's a big thing with for example japanese kanji have like generally they won't have things in a bold font because it starts to make a lot of their stuff really difficult to read and then there's also almost like cultural things there were certain things like on the handbook like i was saying like because it's it's meant to be a bit handwritten and it's sort of meant to be like heck the, like the main characters kind of notes there were bits where we were deliberately kind of like offsetting bits of text so yeah. that it would kind of jiggle like subsequent lines were jigging left and right and like the our localization partner said like oh look in like in japanese this this really doesn't go across very well at all like people don't like that kind of thing so <laughs> it, was, it was really interesting from a kind of cultural point of view we was super lucky that the game kind of doesn't rely on the text it's a game that you can like you could pick it up and you could play it not fully understanding any of the words on the screen like the text is very much there for kind of a lot of the jokes and stuff like that but you can kind of get away without it so yeah we were, we were pretty lucky in that sense it was quite a quite a learning experience getting getting a whole bunch of these different languages in yeah now the title is super clever as many people in the world have dead-end jobs that they really hate but in this case he's actually eliminating dead ends so to speak so the first question is for Hector, is does he enjoy his job, or is this a dead end job to him? You think? So first of all, thank you. Naming stuff is super, super difficult. Um, I think the name kind of came to me at one point fairly early on, and it was just immediately like, yeah, this works absolutely perfectly for what we're trying to do. This is what we're going for, and thankfully, no one else has ever named the game it. Uh, so we like we could snag all of the domains and all of that kind of stuff. It's really bad for uh, Twitter searching. Like, so I've kind of got Twitter searches set up for like the game name and stuff, and you get a lot of people just being really mean about each other's jobs. That's not so great. In terms of the game, it was always a thing of 
I wanted he- like Hector enjoys his job like it's not a dead end job to him like he's super keen super enthusiastic again like one of the sort of references for him well so that like the two main references for him one was spongebob like at the Crust- crusty crab that it's like other people might look down on his job but he loves it and like this is just something where it's like he just really enjoys going to work every day and i mean why wouldn't you like you're shooting ghosts all the time and the other one is slightly more esoteric it's dan goodman in the film arachnophobia which is probably I can't remember which year it came out now, but it's probably quite an old reference yeah. <laughs> now. I don't know how old your audience tend to be. Right. Uh, like he's again, like so he's uh, like a, a bug catcher, like a, a, a rent a kill kind of guy. But he really enjoys his job as well. Like he he enjoys kind of having that knowledge and just generally doing his job. And yeah, like I think it's one of these things that like people can be really mean about other people's jobs, but it's like look, man, if people enjoy their jobs, then then yeah more power to them yeah absolutely now for completionists out there there's a handbook which catalogs everything you encounter in the game how many hours of gameplay do you anticipate needed to fill out that book quite a lot uh, <laughs> I've, never actually, I've never actually kind of sat down and really worked it out like i think a single playthrough of a month would probably take you somewhere around six to eight hours or something like that you'd probably get all of the ghosts in a single playthrough, that would be easy enough. But there are, hun- like I said, there are a hundred items in the game, and some of them are pretty rare to drop. You have to, like, you have to play like kind of some of the later levels have an increased chance of dropping them. Um, and then there are some where, for example, you have to have used a certain other item in order to start making that one start turning off. So we've got like there's there's a few bits and pieces like that, um, and then there are some which. There's a birthday present and a birthday cake, which both spawn. They do spawn in the game, but they're pretty rare, um, unless you're playing on uh, Ant Workshop's birthday, in which case they turn up a lot more freely. So if people can figure out when Ant Workshop was created. Oh, interesting. That's a nice little Easter egg. Yeah, yeah you can kind of get them. Uh, like Originally, we'd kind of thought about putting it on the, the developer's birthdays, but then I really didn't want to let random internet people kind of give them a reason to to start trying to hunt out what I would do. It's a birth hour. Yeah, it's curious. It'd be interesting if Game Center had a birthday thing where you're able to put in your birthday and then game developers could hook into that to do things like that. Yeah, I mean, that sort of thing would be nice. I mean, one of the things with Apple Arcade, like one of the things that Apple were like were really clear about and adamant about is, is like being very respectful of like user data. So again, like games and Arcade don't generally have any analytics in them or any of that kind of stuff. Like there's no ads, there's no ad tracking, there's no play pattern tracking or any of that sort of stuff. I'm not entirely sure how much of that would be, would be possible. But yeah, so like in terms of like actually kind of filling up and getting the game to sort of 100% completion, I think it I think it would take people a very long time. Yeah. And is there a special Game Center achievement for when that happens? No. So we kind of wanted the achievements to be a lot more actually achievable. Yeah, uh, that's fair. Like, Instead of having someone, oh gosh, there's this one left. But um, uh, Yeah, on. I, re- I really didn't want to have something in there where it's like only, like only one or two people in the whole world are going to get that achievement kind of thing. Like, I mean, there's some that are in there that are that are very tough because the, the, so there's an achievement for like so as you say like there's different districts in the game and there's achievements for finishing jobs in each district without taking any damage which is like some of the later ones of that like I'm, i think those are probably going to be the tougher ones for people to get yeah and do you have any favorite just quirky achievements that are just good fun to, that were thrown in there yeah there's a few different ones for using certain items like there's like a music man achievement for like if you've used like all of the like a few different of the musical items that are in the game um and i really like that and um there's one relating to unicorns that i i really like as well one of the other things that i really enjoyed when we were making it i mean there's so much so much of the stuff in this game essentially comes down to i just had a daft idea and thought wouldn't it be a bit fun if we did that <laughs> But again, because of, like all of your achievements are also in the handbook and stuff, we thought it'd just be nice to kind of theme them as milk tops or like pogs. The game's kind of so heavily rooted in like sort of eighties and nineties kind of cultural nostalgia and all of that sort of stuff. That yeah, we we kind of like uh, went okay, we we can make them all different things. But one of the things that that really st- always struck me about pogs was because they're all 
in kind of like different sets. They're all made by different artists. So we basically had to go out and kind of find, uh, I think we found about five or six different artists in the end and sort of said to them like, okay, can we give you like a set of, like here's five different achievements. Uh, Here's like a whole lot of reference screenshots from the game and like the characters and stuff so that you know what you're drawing. But can you just like, can you do your own take on what that achievement icon should look like in your own kind of like personal house style? So we've got like the achievement icon so it's like I really love some of them like there's one of the artists a guy called Tom Mead has like this really ornate kind of like almost nightmare before Christmas kind of like black and white style his achievement icons are really striking now do you have any tips for people with combat and staying alive and not getting hurt during levels what are your tips for improving at the game generally keep moving is always a good one it's really easy to kind of get boxed in by enemies uh, so yeah if you if you kind of keep moving there's like there's some enemies where like kind of prioritizing your targets will be really useful so for example once you start getting a little way into the game healing enemy like sort of medic type enemies that'll turn up they'll like that are able to like heal all the other enemies or uh, shield them from damage and that sort of stuff so kind of like prioritizing which enemies are going to be best to take out first uh, is always good and also just using all of their items there are a lot of items in the game like i say and uh, they often like they often start off spawned in the room but also if you're shooting scenery like you'll often find like items get like thrown out like filing cabinets and stuff like that if you shoot them so kind of don't hang on to items there's like there's almost always more items in the current level so using everything that you've got available to you is is always super useful as well and there's a setting to automatically use health items as you get them which is really nice to have i think that was actually our publisher head up that was probably their idea but yeah again it it comes down to this sort of thing of like we we wanted that if a player wants to there's there's a whole bunch of kind of like settings there for things like that that make it like that kind of make the game so it's it's helping you out a bit more the power-ups they're left i think purposely vague as to what they do until you use them for the first time kind of can't go into like the power-ups and the design process for what you ended up using for all those or some of them i should say so as you catch more and more ghosts in the game you kind of fill up your tank and then when you when your tank's full you can level up like you can get a promotion and you get like a new job title uh, and the game picks three power-ups for you and then you can choose which one of those three power-ups you want and yeah like we did have like a bit of a backwards and forwards between the designers on the game as as to should we have it so that power-ups and so that like all of the items and things like it explicitly says to you like okay choosing this power-up will increase your shot uh, damage by 20 percent but will also increase your gun overheating by 10 percent or should we keep it so it's like just a bit more vague and a bit more in character that's where we ended up going to i think like a lot of the idea behind that was that it would be something that kind of people people could chat about and it would maybe be like a a, a increase like the kind of exploration aspect of the game and like the sort of social aspect of the game that people on internet forums or on twitter or whatever could kind of maybe like chat and like start making like these guides of like okay this one does this and this one does this and start digging into it a little bit more but like in terms of like the items as well like the items that you find some of them uh, quite weird we just thought like and you just really like this idea of like that you find like you're finding these weird items and then just using them and you don't really know what they're going to do but it's probably going to be useful some of them aren't quite as useful but are quite funny it just really appealed to me like this this kind of whole idea of hector would be the sort of person that would go into a place and find this like weird glowing artifact thing and just use it and see what it did yeah and the uh book which is just so much fun to look through all the items that you collect and kind of digging into the descriptions that you wrote up for all of them and it's it's quite nice oh thank you there was a point in time kind of as we were coming towards finishing the game where we have there's i think there's 60 enemies in the game and 100 items and there was basically a deadline of we need to get all of this stuff written <laughs> so that we can get it all localized. And so there was there was a, a big time when I basically just sat down and had to really scour, like scour every depth of my mind for kind of funny or weird or like things to write about 
different items. And some items, it's super easy because some items, like uh, or like some of the enemies, are like really themed. Like you say, like the sort of chicken or something is like okay, that's that's really themed. Some of the items are a little bit more like, for example, there's a whole bunch of different food items and stuff like that, and it's like okay, how how many different jokes can I make about different types of food? <laughs> now, there's a help wanted website within Dead End Job for you to find bounties. And I love kind of the 90s feel of this. And the domain, the main domain you own, have you considered making that domain a live URL for something on your website, like a careers page or something that would kind of play off the help wanted thing? Yeah, so the uh so that's protagonists.net which yeah so it, like in the game like you say it takes the it's kind of like a, a challenge system like it's a way of you making extra money for the in game or you can also use it to occasionally it'll come up with challenges where you earn tokens but it was sort of a thing where we would like we had thought about putting something up on the domain it was just, it was it was a bit tricky we couldn't quite decide kind of how much of a rabbit hole to go down <laughs> right make it into a real thing or not but what i will say is like there are email addresses that are in the game and there are some email addresses that aren't in the game but that you can kind of figure out and all of those email addresses are active email addresses and if you email them you will get messages back from the uh, game characters so, oh, that's great. So we've had, we've we have had a couple of people kind of already like emailing in and kind of getting these automated replies from like the game characters and stuff. So you could write in saying, uh, "I have a ghost, please help me." Yeah. So it was it was kind of one of these things that I, I did again. Like I wanted to sort of put in like, okay, if someone is inquisitive enough to kind of go like, "Oh, hey, what, what happens if I email like the info at email address like for a particular Gone, which is like the sort of company in the game, or like one of these other other things uh what, what would actually happen there so i think in the end yeah i think there's I think we've got about eight eight different email addresses or something that all actually work oh that's great and then early on in the game you get access to the art gallery that lets you unlock three different art pieces by trading in tickets are there any other unlockables like music for example that you've thought about incorporating as well in future updates yes yeah, so the art gallery is like you say it's something where it's like you can spend the tokens that you get from the challenges on unlocking stuff and that was sort of something again that we put in for like the 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 kind of big fans of the game like that was you know always intended as like okay we've got like all of this kind of behind the scenes concept artwork and like there's different um character studies of like uh, what different people in the game looked like and uh, different enemies that we never ended up using and loads and loads of different concept art and stuff and we just thought it'd be like a nice thing to kind of put it in so that people can see it all because there's so much work gets put into a game that yeah. people ever actually end up seeing so yeah I, like i think it's something where we could potentially expand that stuff uh in future updates and kind of there was a bit of me that wanted to put in a director's commentary but i could never quite figure out how it would work right yeah because yeah i've seen that for some games but it is a hard thing to kind of do especially for your kind of game yeah i think like i think other titles that i've seen that have got that sort of stuff it's always quite linear like linear sort of story based things yes whereas yeah something like dead end job and like yeah i'm just not quite sure how we would yeah it's mostly the walking simulators i've seen that as they call the walking simulators uh have those that are very story driven as you're kind of exploring this world there is a leveling up system and you get different perks when you level up how does the system work and do different players end up with a different hector by the end of the game and i think dying does reset some of that or all of it is that right? So when you catch ghosts, it, uh, uh, that fills up your tank, um, which incidentally, like, so there are ways, there are items and there are, like, there are powers and things that you can do to destroy ghosts, but without catching them. So there's like a little bit of a, an element there of like, okay, if I've got like a, a really powerful item, I can use that almost as a smart bomb to get rid of, like clear the room and kind of get rid of the the threat for me but then i don't like you, you don't earn like the xp or whatever to fill up your tank to kind of level up from that but yeah so when you level up uh, the game picks three random power-ups out of the power-ups that you've got available to you and there is behind the scenes there is like a, a 
kind of chart of okay if you get this one then it stops these other ones from becoming available and you need to be at this level to for this one to be available and all of that kind of stuff but again it was one of these things where i never want to explicitly have like a, a big chart in front of the player where it's like okay if you put points into this then you do this and if you put points in that felt kind of too organized for something that's generally like quite a, a fast paced kind of action game there's something about like the whole kind of like haphazard thing of like okay you you've been promoted you've got like this new job title and stuff and you're like you're getting like a sort of promotional perk from the company but they don't really explain necessarily explain what that is and then uh yeah like you you don't die in the game it's just like when you when you run out of health you fail a job and you get demoted because you've messed up and so you get demoted at your job and then you go all like your job title goes all the way back to the start and you lose like all of your promotional perks um except if you've got the verbal warning perk so there's a thing in there where it's like you can have that and then that means that even when you get demoted you get to keep all of your perks for kind of like one iteration of a verbal warning there is stuff in there where like players can players can end up with like quite different kind of setups like some of the perks that you get do lock off some of the other ones so for example there's ones that you can get where it will mean that when you shoot enemies it slows the enemies down but then that locks off other things that can happen to your weapon so there's one of my favorite ones is you can get shots that it means there's a chance that your shots will bounce off scenery and walls and things if you go down the route of powering up your gun a lot getting that bouncy one can mean that it's like it's just goes kind of crazy and there's like your shots are firing around all over the place um, and it's really cool every time you get promoted um it picks like a, a sort of there's a weapon based perk or there's one that kind of affects you like sort of hector as a person and then there's like a sort of like slightly more miscellaneous category so it's like you can generally sort of err to either like okay i'm going to go for more weapon based stuff or i'm going to do stuff that kind of buffs my kind of characters sort of core abilities a little bit more and i'm trying to remember in the game if as long as you're not in a boss fight room can you enter a room leave it and re-enter it and say pick up items leave the room new items would generate if you're running low on health, is that a strategy to kind of get healthy? No, so the game does track like which items are in room. And also, so if you leave a room early and then come back in again, all of the ghosts will respawn again because we kind of figured out pretty early on, like shooting a couple of ghosts and then uh, shooting a couple of ghosts and then leaving the room and then coming back into the room. Like that would be like a really super easy way to kind right. of like easily kind of get your way through. So every time you come back in the ghosts, respawn but then also that meant that that suddenly became like a really easy way to like cheesily power yourself up because you could shoot catch a few ghosts leave come back catch them. so it actually it tracks which enemies in a room you've already kind of earned a reward from okay gotcha so you can't like you can't kind of like cheese it in that way so yeah like for the most part it keeps track of what like what you've done in a particular room some games in this kind of style as well so this was another thing where we kind of went backwards and forwards on where it's like some games in this style uh, sort of lock you into a room until you've defeated all of the enemies but we didn't want to do that because especially like as you're kind of getting later on in the game like there's quite a nice kind of risk reward element of okay do i just want to go quite quickly through the level and just rescue the people that I need to rescue and get out. And then it's like, I've completed that job and that's fine. And I can kind of keep all my power ups and all that sort of stuff. Or do you try doing as much in that level as you can, but always kind of, you're always running the risk of that you might die and then lose all of your power ups. And you can save everybody and then wait to tackle all the other rooms after that. And when you're about to die, leave at that point. Uh, yes, you could do, yeah, as long as you kind of... So like you said, there's, there's certain rooms that will trap you into them. You're always running that sort of risk of like, okay, I'll, I'll come across a room that's too much for me and then I'll die and then I've kind of messed it up and I should have just left and taken what I had at the time. Now, say Hector completes his mission of saving his co-worker. Is there life after that in this game? Does the story keep going with you tackling rooms with say your co-worker or is there a new game plus or how, how does that all work yes so like i said there's there's kind of the story continues whether you successfully complete a month or whether you fail kind of completing a month the game will like sort of adapts to that and has stuff I don't really want to give too many details sure yeah don't spoil things that you don't want to yeah absolutely 
Um, but it's yeah, it kind of it takes all of that stuff in its stride. But also some formats. Let me think which one. I'm pretty sure it's on Apple TV and on if you're playing on Mac as well. There's drop in, drop out, couch co-op. So a second player can either come in, like if you're playing on a controller, like a, a second player can come in with a, with another controller and they spawn as uh, as Beryl as the mentor ghost character as kind of like a helper something that we wanted to do in order to make it a bit more friendly like we kind of think of it as like a, as a sort of sibling mode where it's like a, a sibling can kind of could come in and they're not the main character um so they're not scoring points or anything like that but like they're able to help the main character so like they can distract enemies and they can like yeah just sort of generally help with uh, items and kind of taking some of the flack away from the main character and because you're a ghost uh, you're invincible so it's kind of like quite a nice friendly kind of um uh sort of couch corp experience and do you know does the ipad version support that because i know it you can hook up multiple controllers to iPads, and that seems like that could be interesting there as well. Oh, I don't think we support it. So I know that we didn't end up supporting it on the phone because there was like this sort of expectation that on a phone you'd be you'd probably be using the touch screen. So it like quite a small screen um and i th- so i think the ipad version might also just be might be using the same thing but i would have to look into that yeah because i was surprised i guess in the final gm build of ios 13 they added multiple s- controller support on ipads and i believe iphones to uh i guess for this kind of reason in multiplayer games i agree with you uh apple tv and mac are probably the main platforms for that but uh yeah be interesting yeah i mean so there's there's a, a whole bunch of like little bits and pieces like so obviously apple arcade has been like there was a lot of kind of details that were being worked on during the year and stuff like that um and there's like there was sort of certain things like the controller spot and stuff like that where it's we've been finishing the game so we've kind of we've been working more on the content rather than kind of like making sure that we kind of have like the sort of full breadth of support for like every kind of combination of uh, of devices and stuff like that so there's definitely stuff there where kind of now as the sort of different like different bits of apple arcade are sort of rolling out so it's like the phone version came out first and then the ipads and the tv version and then the, eventually like when the mac version comes out we do kind of want to kind of loop back and then start patching in like a few extra like kind of bits and pieces and like quality of life stuff into the game. Yeah. And then I saw for users with older 3D touch capable iPhones, they stopped doing 3D touch this year, but there is an option for increased sensitivity when using touch controls with 3D touch. What does that actually impact? Is it the firing rate of your gun or how does that influence your touch controls? So the idea of that was um, if you kind of press quite hard with your shooting like whichever one of your thumbs is doing like the sort of shooting on the touchscreen controls it would use your vacuum instead like so instead of having to use the sort of separate vacuum button oh shoot and then like you could be shooting and then pressing harder in order to sort of uh, switch the vacuum on um but i think that might just be broken if it's not working um so that would have to be something we just have to look into yeah that's really Interesting, because that'll let you quickly switch between the two modes without needing to. Yeah, I like that. That's really smart. Yeah. So when we're like when we put that in, it like it felt like it did feel uh, really nice. So yeah, I'm definitely gonna <laughs> loop back and, and kind of figure out if I can uh, see why that's not working properly. And anything we didn't cover about Dead End Job that you'd like to before we wrap it up? I don't think so. I feel like. Uh, yeah, I feel like we've kind of we've we've definitely uh, gone through everything. I mean, I yeah, it's it's a game like we've been working on it for a while, and it's a game that is just really quite close to my heart. Like I said, like there's just like so much of the sense of humour in it is just like daft jokes that I kind of wanted to put in and all of that sort of stuff. So I just hope people uh, play it and and love it. And uh, yeah, if you like shooting ghosts and if you like kind of 90s cartoons, definitely check it out. It might be the game for you. Excellent. And where can people find more information about Dead End Jobs and any other games in development that you're people should keep an eye out for um so we're kind of we're still working uh on dead end job at the moment um so we don't really have anything uh, uh, about what ant workshop is working on next but for dead end job if you go to www.play 
deadendjob.com. You can see some lovely screenshots and a, a very nice trailer, and it's got the Apple Arcade store link and all kinds of stuff on there. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Tony. It's been just fascinating learning about Dead End Job and the creation of it and all the little Easter eggs in it. And thank you so much. I really appreciate it. No worries, man. Thank you again for having me. It's been lovely to chat. Well, that was my interview with Tony. I'd like to thank him for his time recording this episode. If you haven't already, go and download Dead End Job from Apple Arcade. As I mentioned at the top of this episode, please head on over to Apple Podcasts and spend a couple of minutes to leave a review. Every review goes a long way in helping others discover the show, helping it become more visible in search, all of those great things. You can send your feedback to me at applearcadepodcast at gmail.com. You can find the website at applearcadepodcast.com. And you can follow the show on Twitter at Apple Arcade Plus. On the next episode is Manifold Garden, an atmospheric gravity twisting game. So if you want to play that ahead of time, that is what's coming up next on Apple Arcade Plus. Thanks again for listening. Talk to everyone again real soon.